So from there, we'd like to introduce um, Francois Marie, who is going to be introducing our keynote today. So I'm pretty excited to uh, be introducing a friend of mine, uh, Mako, and I'm really excited about what he's, what he's got to say today, so I'm going to keep this short. Um, but to give you a little bit of, of background, he's currently a researcher at MIT, um, kind of a cross between the School of Management and the Media Lab, so he sort of made up his own program before he, uh, he got a job there. And he's studying uh, sociology of free software communities, contribution, that sort of stuff. But more importantly, I think Mako has been involved in a lot of things, a lot of free software projects, uh, the free culture movement. So he's been a, a long-time Debian developer, for example. He's uh, worked with the Ubuntu project since the very beginning. He, I think he sat down in Mark Shuttleworth's apartment to come up with the code of conduct, uh, the original one anyways. Um, and he's also sitting on a number of boards, uh, like the advisory board for the Wikimedia Foundation and the board of directors for the Free Software Foundation. So overall, very cool guy. Um, he's also a member of the Autonomous Group, which is something that's becoming uh, very important, I think, um, in the free software world because it's all about creating free network services. Uh, so things like Identica, for example, as an alternative, a free as in freedom alternative to Twitter. Um, and various other things. But perhaps the, my favorite website um, in all of the things that Mako is running is unhappybirthday.com. And um, I don't know how many people here have seen it. Can I see a show of hand? Oh, a few people, okay. Um, basically what that website is about is um, you may or, or, or may not know that um, the happy birthday song the lyrics to it are actually still under copyright. And if you do a public performance of it, for example, you sing happy birthday to Rusty, um, that's actually illegal in the United States and in New Zealand. Now, it's not really enforced, but you know it's criminal activity that we need to, um, to put a stop to. And that's why he built that website. So basically, he's giving you all the information to report those criminals to the proper authorities. <laughs> so thank you for accepting our invitation to come to LCA, Michael. That's great. It's great to be here. I can give you one happy birthday. So I actually get more hate mail about happy, unhappy birthday than like everything else I put together. Um, I also share a surname with the, the, uh, the, the original author of the song, so everyone thinks that I have like money um, in it. But the best email I got was someone saying, you know, I, I understand that you're the, you know, I, I know you from the free software community and I'm really having trouble reconciling this like high protectionist, like turn in your friends for like singing happy birthday with all of your great work and free culture and free software. And I was like, dude, like satire, right? Like, um, uh, all right. Um, all right. Well, thank you for that wonderful introduction and thanks. It's wonderful being here. Um, I'll give you a quick overview of what I'm trying to do, which is probably too much. Um, uh, the first thing I'm going to try to do is frame this whole discussion in terms of the whole I don't know, free software versus open source debate. And I understand that that is both fraught and sort of very tired territory, especially in a crowd like this. We've been through it many times. You wouldn't believe how many times I've been it through. But I hope to bring something new and, dare I say, more constructive and maybe even conciliatory to the debate. Um, I'm going to argue that although the basic sort of principles versus pragmatism split is valid and that it's a valid description of what's going on, that there are, always, that, that there are ways that the two camps come together that we've sometimes ignored. And... In particular, I'm going to say that there are important practical benefits of freedom, that is, of freedom itself, not of necessarily a development methodology. Um, and th they aren't what we're normally used to thinking of when we talk about open source. Um, I'm going to move into talking about uh, anti-features, which is my topic of today. It's okay if you haven't, if you don't know the term, because I, I made it up. Um, uh, uh, so, uh, but, but you will, if you don't know it by the time you leave this room, um, I've done something wrong. Uh, uh, and I'll, I'll give, uh, I'll, I'll leave you hanging at the moment, but I'll give you some exa examples in a moment, um, which I'm going to argue is one important way of talking about the practical benefits of software freedom. Um, I'm going to walk through a whole bunch of examples of anti-feature, which will hopefully be most of my time here, um, which with the goal of sort of doing three things. The first is sort of giving you a tour of the horrors possible in a world of proprietary software for those of us who are fortunate to have forgotten. 
um, or for the very young ones here, maybe the ones who are fortunate to have never known. Um, I'm going to sort of give a discussion by example of what anti-features are and why they exist. I'm going to give it, uh, uh, I'll show lots of examples. Um, um, DRM is one that I'll talk about, but you'll see more. And I'm going to give a demonstration of the fact that anti-features are only possible because users are kept helpless and out of control in a word sort of unfree or non-free. Um, uh, uh, and at the risk of sounding a little keynote-y, I'm going to uh, try to end by using anti-features to talk about three of what I think are the most important sort of fronts in the broader movement for software freedom. So um, with that introduction out of the way, I will uh, jump into the debate. Um, so uh, uh, in the one corner, we have, uh, we have the sort of GNU head representing uh, Richard Stallman and the Free Software Foundation, who've spent basically the last, I'll try to make this short, the last 20 years talking about the freedom that users, users have, or rather should have, to use, study, modify, share, and collaborate on their software. And the, the normal sort of FSF thing to do is to, you know, uh, give you, again, the sort of free software definition by walking through things, and I'm not going to do that. Um, um, uh, uh, the way that, but I will tell you how I like to think about it, which is that when I think about free software, I tend to think of it less in terms of software and even less in terms of definitions or licenses and more in terms of sort of empowerment and autonomy. Um, and I'll give you an example to describe what I mean. Um, um, so this is, this is an example that I, that I give a number of times. So let's say I, I, I want to, uh, um, uh, if, if I want to send a message to someone, right? Let's, let's say I want to send a message to my partner, Mika, who's back in Boston where it snowed, uh, apparently, like uh, 20 centimeters last night. Um, uh, uh, lucky I'm here. Um, and let's say I want to uh, sort of rub it in and say, oh, my God, I'm in beautiful Wellington. you got you got to see this. It's amazing. There's a beautiful bay. Um, if, I can, if I decide to send Mika a text message, I'm going to be constrained in my ability to send that message, right? I'm going to be constrained to 140 characters in the age of sort of Identica and uh, what's that other one called? Twitter, right? Um, uh, 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 this is a constraint we're used to living with, maybe. Um, but, uh, but, 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 but in any case, um, I, I'm going to be, you know, I can write a haiku, I can try to compress it, but I'm going to be constrained by that medium. If I give her a call, I can send a very different message. If I want to take a picture of Wellington, I can, I, can, I can take a picture, and given that she has the ability to receive that message, she's got a phone capable of receiving it, I can send that picture. I'm going to be constrained by the fact that, you know, this phone has a really crappy camera, but I'll be able to send a message in any case. The point here is that the media that I choose to use, the technology that I have at my disposal is going to frame and constrain the nature of the message that I can say. In an important sense, the technology that I'm using to communicate is going to determine, in, a, in an important sense, what I can say. It's going to determine who I can say it to. You know, she's got to have a phone that can receive the message. It's going to determine when I can say it, how I can say it. But the point is that the, the technology that, that, that I'm using to communicate is, 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 is placing important constraints on the nature, nature of what I can say. And insofar as this technology sort of influences my experience of the world and other people, the question of who gets to control that technology is, 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 is a question of, of who gets to determine how I communicate. Um, now, now, now um, uh, insofar as technology is increasingly sort of framing and mediating our experience of life in the world, you know, this is, I mean, my life is pretty technologically mediated, I can say that. Um, uh, uh, the, the question of who uh, controls that technology is actually a really profoundly important political question. Now, free software, as I like to think about it, is really an, is really an answer to that question, which is to say, which is to say that, that insofar as it's important for us to control our lives and experience of the world, it's important for us to control our technology. That, 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 that users should have control of their technology because users should have control of their life. And technology is an, an increasingly important uh, piece of that. So. That's, that's how I understand free software. Now, now, and that's how I understand this side of the debate. Now, now benefits of freedom include, I guess, this, uh, uh, the warm, fuzzy feeling we get for living in freedom. It's like, benefits of freedom? What are you talking about? Freedom is a benefit in itself, right? All right, so that's the first half. Um, um, the, 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 the second half is, 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 of course, open source, which um, Biela Coleman talked um, about. Uh, gave a really good description of yesterday, this sort of, this sort of shift from, from, from free to open. Uh, open source, of course, was a term invented very explicitly to distance the work of the free software movement and, 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 and many of the people from, from this concept of freedom. In the words of Eric Raymond, um, the, the, the idea that if you say the word free to anyone in a suit, they turn around and run the other direction. I don't know if that's true. I, I keep trying it. I'm at, I'm at this business school. I keep... Uh, but it, uh, uh, tends to not work. Um, um, but, 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 but in any case, the idea is to emphasize a set of pragmatic benefits instead of a set of principled ones. Um, in the words of the open source initiative taken from their website, better quality, higher reliability, more flexibility, lower cost, and an end to predatory vendor lock-in, right? Really practical benefits that are supposed to come from the, the development methodology, right? Inherent practical benefits is what the story is. Now, 
The normal free software response, and this is a back and forth, this is a debate, is that's bad because we're not talking about freedom. Um, and I'm biased here, you know, it's uh, uh, Francois let the cat out of the bag, I'm on the board of the FSF, so that's my response too. It's bad because we're not talking about freedom, right? But that's actually not my, my only response, and I think that's actually the least interesting part of my response, because I also reject what I think is a false dichotomy between these two camps. I believe that there are practical, but the practical benefits really do matter to software freedom and to the adoption of software freedom for a whole number of reasons. But most relevant here, I believe that freedom imparts inherent practical benefits. Freedom itself, not at um, uh, uh, the, that, that has nothing to do with the development methodology. Now, on the one hand, I think, that, I think that the free software camp is right to be wary of talking about the quality, reliability, flexibility, cost, et cetera, um, as an inherent benefit of the, of the sort of free development model, right? Um, and I think it's understandable that we don't normally point this out because it's, uh, uh, but I think that the, that the idea that it's sort of more featureful, et cetera, et cetera, is actually just demonstrably wrong. Um, I don't know, who, who here was using, using, you know, GNU Linux in 95, 94? A bunch of people. So you guys remember, it was really bad then, right? Like, um, I mean, I remember, I remember going to the store with a list of the five CD drives that were supported by the Linux kernel and not being able to find any of them and just not being able to have a CD drive for six months, right? I remember, I remember, I remember, I mean, it, it crashed more. It was less featureful. We didn't do this because it, because it was, it was, it was inherently better. It certainly wasn't inherently better at day one when it had almost no features at all, right? Um, um, I mean, in the dot-com boom, there was this idea that, that, that we could just start companies, and if they were doing open source, you know, money would roll in. I mean, I guess uh, Linux here had a, big, uh, had a big Australian office. Probably a number of people here uh, work there, right? There's a few people. Uh, remember what happened to Linux care? It actually became a proprietary software company. Um, um, and did much better as a proprietary software company before it eventually went out of business. So maybe there were some other issues going on there. Um, 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 but but the point is the point is and what we all learned in that experience was that that open source is actually a little more difficult than sort of putting your code online, slapping a GPL on it, and sort of letting the patches roll in. Um, um, uh, it, it was it, it was a common belief, but it's actually just not true. If you look at if you look do any big surveys of like you know um, collections of, of free software projects, right? If you look at SourceForge or any of these things, right? You see a very similar distribution of projects, which is that the median number of contributors to SourceForge projects, the median number of contributors, want to guess? One. Not zero, you have to, <laughs> uh, 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 the media, 95th percentile, 95% of, 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 of free software projects, five people, five contributors. Um, um, median numbers of commits to a source control repository, there's your zero. Um, um, the benefits are not inherent and the benefits are not automatic. The benefits of mass collaboration, lots of people committing code, don't respond even for most successful projects, projects that have been downloaded thousands of times, because only one person has ever contributed. You can't really have mass collaboration with yourself. Um, I've been trying, um, 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 but, but, freedom does lead to practical benefits, um, always. Um, and, and these benefits have nothing to do with, with, with issues like low cost and flexibility and have everything to do with freedom. So, um, uh, to back away from freedom, for, to, I'll take you briefly, just briefly, uh, to the world of proprietary software. We'll actually end up here. Um, because the world of proprietary software is a world of firms controlling users to their own benefit and to users' disadvantages. It's a world where users' rights and desires come after their technology producers, desire for profit, or the desires of a third party or a friend, a strategic partner. I think that's what they call friends in, in business. I'm in a business school now, so uh, um, uh, uh, I, can, I can speak with authority. Uh, 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 I, uh, the, the, the result is software that is full of features that users hate. Um, features that users hate so much they are willing and often do pay money to, to, if they're lucky enough to be able to, to have those features removed. Um, I call these features anti-features. Um, um, like a feature, an anti-feature is built. It's not something, it's something that requires effort. It's not a bug. It's not a missing feature. It's, 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 it's added functionality, intentionally added functionality, but it's negative functionality in the sense that it's, that it makes technology do something that you don't want it to do. Which brings us back to free software. Um, because free software gives users control. Control in a way that I've talked about a few minutes ago, you know, with the, um, um, over what our technology does. And anti-features are a way of designing software in ways that exploit, um, exploit users. Now, when users have control, they're given a choice in the matter. Do you want to be exploited? Um, my experience has been that users tend to choose not to be exploited. 
Um, um, the result is that quite simply is that anti-futures are impossible in a world, uh, in, in, in a free world in, in, in the long term, right? So in this sense, defense against anti-futures represents an inherent advantage. And, I, and you'll, you'll hear, if you're a little confused, that's okay, because I'm going to spend the rest of the talk talking about this. Um, um, but it represents an inherent advantage, like an actually inherent advantage of free software over competing proprietary technologies. And it stems directly from freedom, not from a development methodology. As such, it represents a sort of compromise or a middle ground on the debate, or at least I'm going to argue that it does. And now, you know, um, hopefully some of you are thinking, but come on, features users hate, right? Like, uh, uh, you know, what are you talking about? How common could these be? And I hope to spend much of the rest of the talk uh, uh, explaining just how common these are, right? By showing you that they are everywhere and that they are an inextricable part of the proprietary software development project uh, process. So the best way to explain anti-features, I think, is to show you what I'm talking about through examples. And I've broken these examples down into four groups based on sort of why they exist, so we can understand not just what they are, but how, where they come from, so. Um, uh, the, first, the first is pretty straightforward to anyone who understands roughly how like, the mafia works, um, um, uh, uh, which is to say, you know, this like, ah, oh, it's a very dangerous street here, you better buy protection or your window might get broken, right? Because you know, the guy's going to break your window if you don't pay him money. Um, um, they're also, uh, it's this idea of sort of selling protection, right? They're also clear to anyone who remembers, remember these things, people used to sit on them to be a little taller? Um, uh, uh, phone books, right? Who here's paid to have a phone, a phone number not listed in the phone book, right? Right? A number of people, right? It is actually more difficult to print, I mean, like, it should be obvious, right? It's more difficult to print a number in the phone book than it is to not print a number in the phone book, right? Um, uh, uh, so it's the, it's, it's the same basic sort of idea of offsetting costs from other people, though. And this is a, this is, this is a really common type of anti-feature in the source of, a, uh, source of a lot of these. So let's say that, that, that um, you know, uh, company A has a product or service that they're giving to users. The phone company is listing, uh, you know, is giving you, giving you a phone service, so they have your number, right? Another company comes along, uh, 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 telemarketer um, comes along and says, hey, I'd love to, I'd love to have your, um, uh, I'd love to have this phone number, uh, I'd love to have these phone numbers of people, I'm willing to pay you, I don't know, a dollar, a dollar for every phone number so that I can start uh, spamming, uh, uh, telemarketing, uh, telespamming people, right? Um, and, and, and so the phone company says, great, it sounds good. But then they say, oh, wait, but some people might not want that. So they turn around to you and they say, well, listen, uh, someone's giving us a dollar to let us uh, spam you. If you don't want to be spammed, how about you give us two dollars, right? Um, simple sort of idea. They're going to get a dollar either way. Um, they're either going to get it from you, or they're going to get it from the, or they're going to get it from the telespammer. Um, uh, uh, simple sort of idea. So anyway, um, getting back to sort of computer technology, right? Um, uh, people, people remember Gator or Claria. So, so Gator was a piece of software installed on 35 million computers. 35 million computers, which was impressive because no one actually, almost no one ever remembered installing Gator on their computer. Um, it turns out Gator is like the, was the most successful piece of spyware in history. It was a piece of software that was installed on Windows computers that would uh, do things like monitor your clickstream and intercept ads that were coming in, banner ads, and replace them with different banner ads. It was like really nasty stuff, right? Um, um, uh, no one liked it, and it was, and it was, and it was um, um, infamous in this sense, right? It shipped, um, uh, no one downloaded Gator because it shipped with, ex with, with other pieces of software. It shipped with a lot of peer-to-peer -peer clients, things like Kazaa, things like Morpheus, Things like um, and things like Divex. This is one of the big ones, right? Divex, the 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 video decoding software that came with Windows um, that you download for Windows. And so you download the software that you actually want, and it would come bundled with. I mean, in the case of Kazaa, sometimes many different pieces of spyware, sometimes which would attack each other, like sort of like core wars on your computer. Um, uh, 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 all software you didn't want, and so. This, this really simple idea of people giving stuff that you don't want. Now, of course, DivX offered a premium version of their Windows software for $19.95. And if you paid $19.95, you got the same software, except it didn't come with the spyware, right? Like, it was actually a smaller zip file. Um, uh, uh, there, there, there was just less there, and there weren't a lot of extra features, right? Now, now, that's just one piece of software, right? It works in lots of ways. I understand that this is very difficult to read, so I'm going to read it to you. Uh, it's just, it's, it's, it's great. This is, a, this is an example from Sony, which is sort of the, 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 the sort of spyware uh, thing on a, on a larger scale. Sony, so this is, this is a, a, an option from the sort of configurator if you're buying a computer, of we're buying a VIO computer. And it options, offers you two choices. The first is no fresh start, um, which says, subtract $49.99, which is a weird idea. By not getting it, you subtract money. Um, and two, fresh start. And the description of fresh start is opt for a fresh start, trademark. And your VIO PC will undergo a system optimization service where specific VIO applications, trial software, and games will be removed from your unit prior to shipment. Fresh Start safely scrubs your PC to free up valuable hard disk space and conserve memory and processing power while maximizing overall system performance right from the start. 
So basically, they're going to charge you 50 bucks to remove all the trialware, spyware, and crapware from, from your computer before you buy it, right? Um, so Engadget did a review of this laptop and reported that it had so much, that it had so much sort of trialware and crapware that the, that the computer blue screen the first time they booted it and crashed when they tried to shut it down. Um, laptop Magazine reported that the, 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 the video in question, quote, behaved as if it was broken, unquote, before the unwanted software was removed. Um, I mean, you could pay 50 bucks and they'd remove it for you, right? Um, uh, s s simple, sort of, s simple sort of mafia tactic. Right? But the idea is, is that Sony's going to get 50 bucks here. They're getting paid something like $50 from, from, the, the, from the, 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 all the people who are paying them to install this trial were on your computer. And, you can pay, and they're going to get 50 bucks either way. It's either from you or it's from these other people, right? Simple sort of idea. Now, Sony eventually relented after getting a lot of bad publicity. And as you can see, they're still getting bad publicity because I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I'm giving it to them now. Um, uh, uh, but, but, uh, uh, but, and this is, so this talk is a good example of that, but it's, but, but it's a simple sort of idea. All right. Here's the second class of, uh, second, second class or reason for anti features, which is sort of market segmentation now. Uh, uh, market segmentation is what they call it in business schools because segmenting sounds better than discrimination. Price discrimination is the other, other, uh, here. I forget who used this example that if, that if people sat on an airplane with the, with the price they paid for their ticket above their head, there would be riots. People would be killing each other. Um, um, it's this idea that, uh, market segmentation is this idea that different people for the, will pay different amounts of money for the same product, right, or for very similar products. And so the idea of segmenting a market is breaking the market into little pieces so that people who can pay more do, um, and people who pay less don't. Um, um, so so, so the, the, history of, the history of Microsoft Windows is probably a better description of sort of like market segmentation through anti-features than, I could, than I, could, I could wish for. It includes some of my favorites, so uh, here it is, um, uh, or at least, at least part of it. Um, this, is, this is one of my all-time uh, uh, favorite anti-features. This is the story of Microsoft Windows NT Workstation 4.0. And Windows, Microsoft, and Microsoft Windows NT Server 4.0. Um, so, so, so back in 1995 or 96, Microsoft released two versions of Windows NT, one for workstations, one for servers. And according to Microsoft, they were, quote, two very different products intended for two very different functions, right? Um, NT Server, um, Microsoft claimed, was suited and tailored for use as an internet server, while um, workstation was, quote, grossly inadequate. Um, so aiming to enforce this difference, or rather to reflect this difference, um, Windows NT Server could have an unlimited number of TCP IP connections, whereas the workstation could only have 10 concurrent TCP connections. Um, um, you know, it's a, just, it, it, was, it was designed so it wasn't as good, so that, you know, it was, it was, it was for your... It was for your help. Well, well uh, uh, um, a journalist at O'Reilly noticed that, you know, other than this restriction and a few other things, they were actually very similar pieces of software. In fact, they were very, very similar pieces of software. They were bit-for-bit bit identical pieces of software. If you actually took the software and hashed them, every file that was present in NT Workstation was also present in NT Server, and it, and it was exactly the same. It turned out that upon examination, the only difference between Windows NT Workstation and NT Server was a single bit in the registry, um, which, said th which was set by the installer, which said, this is a workstation or this is a server. Um, and, 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 what, and, and Microsoft Windows NT would start up and check to see if it was a workstation or if it was a server. And if you were unfortunate enough to, for, for, for it to be marked as a workstation, it would, it would invoke a bunch of code which would arbitrarily limit your TCP connections to 10. Right? There was an engineer at Microsoft, maybe even a team of people at Microsoft, whose job it was to build the software to, li to, to limit people's TCP connections to 10. Now, now, the users were very happy when they found out about this, because you could have an $800 upgrade to your software just by flipping one bit in the registry. Um, uh, but um, uh, uh, th that was 1996, right? Things, have, things are much better, right? Um, 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 uh, I need to... Now I need to I need to I need to update this to a list of uh, uh, Windows uh, uh, Seven, right? But uh, um, in any case, uh, 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 I, I left this on here because I like to talk about Vista Starter so much. So, so the major difference between all these different versions of uh, Windows uh, uh, Windows Vista, and which is actually also one of the major differences between different versions of Windows Seven, is actually how much memory you'd like to run on your computer. There's actually a function in Windows which arbitrarily limits the amount of memory that Windows will use. And if you get Windows Home ba Windows Vista or Windows Seven Home Basic, that that one is limited to, I don't know, I'm making it up, eight, 8 gigabytes of memory. And if you get home premium, you can use up to 16 gigabytes of memory. And if you want to use more and more, you have to keep, you have to keep going up, right? Um, uh, arbitrary limits set by the software. There's an engineer or a team whose job it is to, to create these limits, to test them, to put it into computers with more memory, to make sure that it's there. 
um, to, to, make, to make sure that it doesn't work, right? Um, and you can choose between uh, uh, you can choose between which version depending on what you want to do. Now I'm going to talk. Uh, it's worth talking about Windows Vista Starter because this should have been called. Like, this is just like it's great. Uh, it belongs in my like uh, uh, my Hall of Fame of of, of, of anti features um, because Windows Vista Starter had a li limit a, a limit of several gigabytes of memory, sort of your simple simple thing. Um, uh, B 250 gigabytes of disk space, um, not too much, but you have a little space. And 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 C, my favorite, a limit to three running applications with a user interface at any given time. You can only run three graphical applications on, on, on Windows Vista Starter. Now, the idea was that Microsoft was basically giving this stuff, giving this away, or at least selling it for really cheap. It was trying to compete with netbooks and really trying to compete with free software. Um, so like these uh, sort of new Linux systems. And, and, and the idea behind, um, behind Starter was that they, they, they paid an engineering team to write a feature to, and this is actually a non-trivial problem, to, to determine how many applications are running with a graphical user interface, to monitor to see if an application launched is going to start to write a graphical user interface, to if you've already running, running three, to pop up a dialog box for the user to explain that they have already reached the maximum number of graphical user interfaces, right? This is actually like a, a it, it's not a trivial problem, and I can guarantee that it's not something that anyone wanted. The idea behind Windows Vista Starter was to make a version of Windows so bad that any user who could possibly afford to buy a more expensive version of Windows would pay to get out, get away from it. Um, that's actually the goal here. Um, um, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and at least in some cases it worked. So, so you can imagine not, not a lot of people requested, no, I, 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 I love, I love Windows Vista Home Basic, but the problem is I can just run too many graphical applications, you know? Like it would be really great if I could, if I could run a few less. Um, um, but, but of course, these kinds of anti-features are, are, are in no way limited only to, uh, to, to you know, uh, computer software. Which is stuff that runs on sort of things we're more used to thinking of as computers. Here's a picture of the Canon, the, the Canon G7, which is a uh, um, um, uh, digital digital camera. The G1 through the G6 um, uh, all had a feature that ha had the ability to shoot to shoot RAW. This is sort of one of their in-between lines. It was a they, they weren't Canon wasn't quite sure if it was uh, if it wasn't if it was a uh, like an amateur camera or sort of like a uh, I don't know what they call it, prosumer or whatever like a a, a, a better camera. So so for um, so so RAW is what Canon considers a, 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 a sort of professional feature. So what they did was when they when they moved from the G6 to the G7, they created a camera that was faster, had more, um, had a faster processor, had had a, had a bigger card that came with it. Um, but when, the, but, but it, but it lost the ability to take raw. The idea was is that they were trying to segment the market. People who can, you know, the, the sort of pro people, they wanted to push towards cameras like the, you know, these digital SLRs, and then this would be sort of the high-end amateur camera, so it wouldn't have raw. So they're using it as a feature to, to to push people to more expensive cameras. Now the thing about raw, I don't know, if people, people raw is not really a format. RAW is actually just raw sensor data off of, a, off of your camera. So actually, every time anyone takes a picture on any camera, a raw photo exists in memory on your camera. Um, and for those that um, normally what happens is that it's compressed into a JPEG and written to your card. Now, now it should go without saying, compressing a JPEG is more difficult than not compressing a JPEG, right? Um, uh, but, but the idea was that they removed the ability to write a JPEG. Um, or didn't allow people access to it be because they wanted to push people towards more expensive cameras. Um, and the reason I'm bringing this example up is because there's a free software story here as well. Um, um, because a number of people annoyed by this, annoyed by the fact that their preferred line of camera lost this feature or really had an anti-feature added, said, you know what, we could really easily use a free software system or do a little intervention into this and, 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 and get access to this and, and get access to raw data. Because of course, they didn't have to write any, they didn't have to write any significant amount of code to get access, to, to, to make the thing write raw. All they needed to do was make it not write JPEG. Right? They needed to make the camera not do something in order to store raw. And so the Canon Hackers Dev Kit was started, um, I mean, you can see from their logo, they've got raw written right there, um, was started as, as, uh, as an attempt to, to make cameras, uh, to, 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 to help Canon cameras get access to this raw data, um, specifically because of this, this shift. Um, uh, I mean, this is sort of showing that, that in the world, that, that in the world of, of, uh, of uh, proprietary software, not only are anti-features sort of tempting, they're, they're irresistible. But in a world where freedom is an option, even an option like I can write a little bit of code that runs on top of my proprietary firmware, um, they're entirely unsustainable. My third, this is my, the, 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 my, my third reason for anti-features is, is simple. It's this sort of idea of sort of creating, extending, and sort of securing monopolies, right? Um, uh, I saw uh, this is this is a Panasonic camera and their battery. Someone sent an email out a couple days ago about like Panas the title like to the LCA list like like Panasonic batteries. I'm like, oh my god, they've, 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 they're on to me. Um, but it was actually just someone lost their charger. Um, uh, 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 er earlier this summer, Panasonic released a uh, uh, Panasonic released uh, uh, a firmware update 
to their camera, which if you installed it, um, many people installed the firmware update. They updated it to the new version of their camera, and their, and, and their, and their camera stopped working completely. It wouldn't, wouldn't power on. Turns out the firmware update included, uh, uh, included a little bit of code, which determined if you were running a third-party battery, and if you were, it would just not use it at all. It would disable it. Um, and, and, and we can make fun of Panasonic. In fact, I'm doing it right now. Um, uh, uh, and, and vilifying can uh, uh, Panasonic. But in fact, this is inc inc incredibly widespread, and when most people do it, they're just a little bit smarter than Panasonic. This is a quote from Ross Anderson's book, Security Engineering. Um, uh, it's which, you know, I'll, I'll read it here. It says, It is common for the makers of game consoles to build in challenge response protocols to prevent software cartridges or other accessories from being used with their products unless a license fee is paid. The practice is spreading. According to one vendor of authentication chips, some, um, some printer companies have begun to embed authentication in printers to ensure that genuine toner cartridges are used. If a competitor's product is loaded instead, the, com the, the, the printer will quietly downgrade from 1,200 dpi to 300 dpi. Um, in mobile phones, much of the profit is made on batteries, and authentication protocols can be used to spot competitors' products so they can be drained more quickly. Um, uh, basically, there, there are people who work for a lot of embedded systems um, uh, companies whose job is, I mean, there's people in the room, who, whose job is to, to write code to determine if a third-party battery is being used, and if so, to turn off the power-saving features, right? So, 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 so unlike the Panasonic case where we can, you know, make fun of Panasonic, we, you know, in, in the vast majority of these cases, or at least, in, at least in a number of these cases, we'll never know. Um, I think, it's, I think it's fair to say that no user has ever demanded that, you know, the problem is that I just get... The battery life I get is too good out of these third-party battery uh, third-party batteries. I'd really I'd really love it to be a little worse, right? Um, uh, 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 this is incredibly widespread. Um, uh, TI is very proud of their battery authentication chip, um, uh, Texas, Texas Instruments. It it it, it costs one dollar and thirty cents. This is in units of U.S. in units of a thousand or more. So this is the price they pay. That's one dollar and thirty cents, like wholesale price, um, in the cost of each battery, right? For your $10 batteries that you're buying for your mobile phones, you're paying $1.30 for a chip, which is designed to, if you are buying that, uh, to, to, if you buy this from anyone other than, the, the, than your manufacturer, to, ha to have it work less well, right? So we're paying for this. We're paying for it in the long term. We're also paying for it in the short term when we buy this stuff, right? It's an important piece of what we're paying for. Now, now, now this is a press release from, um, uh, from, from Atmel, who's very proud that they've reduced the cost to about 80 cents in, in large units um, for their battery authentication chip. Um, it, it has, th this one has SHA-256 because SHA-1 wasn't strong enough. Um, uh, um, this is an arms race, right? Fought between a set of, you know, uh, third-party third battery manufacturers and a set of sort of mobile phone people who are trying to milk more money out of us. And the collateral damage is us. It's the users. Um, it's trying to protect this, it's trying to protect these high margins, right, that we are all paying. Um, but it only works because we as users of devices like this and, you know, uh, like this, com like this computer are basically helpless, divided, and entirely dependent on the people producing our technology. We can't see what's going on because if we could, and, and we certainly can't change it because, because if we could, we wouldn't allow this to happen. Um, the, 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 the this, this, this sort of secured monopolies are also an important part of what makes it possible for sort of this loss leader sort of business model, right? Many subscription-based services, these are the subscriptions you can't really leave, right? Printer cartridges are a complicated, um, uh, are, are a complicated example. They now include a, a lot of technology in them, which is basically designed to make it difficult for you to either refill your cartridge or to get someone else to do it. There was a big copyright case in the U.S. over the copyright in the code on the printer cartridges. Um, uh, uh, that's used to do authentication, and yet we pay for it every time we buy one of these devices, right? This is the idea, they sell you the, the printer for really cheap because they know you're gonna have to buy new, new uh, cartridges from them going forward. Um, game systems work the same way, right? The Xbox is like the clear example because the Xbox was, of course, uh, the original Xbox was basically just a, it was a normal PC. It had a normal hard disk, it had a normal processor. I mean, it was basically just like a, a normal, a normal computer. And there was a huge amount of energy and effort that went on inside of Microsoft to turn the Xbox from a normal computer, which it was, into a computer that could not run most programs, right? And then, in fact, could only run a few things. In fact, um, uh, in particular, the Xbox was engineered very specifically not to run GNU Linux, right? Um, uh, and its inability to, 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 its inability to run GNU Linux was a very expensive ANSI feature, right? And it's one that we all paid for, or at least those of us that bought Xboxes paid for. I guess I didn't buy an Xbox, so. Um, uh, but, but it's a clear sort of example. TiVoization is another uh, idea, this idea that, uh, uh, in that, in that it's a similar sort of model. You, you, you know, you build the system and then lock it down so you can't change the software that's running on it. But the interesting thing about TiVoization, of course, is that it's, is that it's built around free software, a Linux kernel, a bunch of, a, a bunch of fr free pieces. But the idea is, is that we're going to keep people from changing, from changing the way that it works so that they're sort of dependent on a subscription model so that they keep paying money. It's a good example of, of, of how, um, and I think it's also a good example of how a focus on issues of licensing and on these sort of explicit, you know, the, the 
yes, this software is under a free license is a good example of how we sort of miss the important issues of autonomy and control. So um, this is my fourth and uh, final example of why they exist before I get into the uh, um, description of how it's out here. This is the idea of sort of protecting protecting copyrights. Um, I think pre protecting in, in scare quotes because it's not, it's like protecting from who? Like from, from us. Um, uh, someone, someone must recognize this, no? Does anyone recognize this? Yeah, SimCity. This is the, so maybe hard to read up there. It's almost impossible to read. This was actually intentional. It was made impossible to read in particular because it was made to be impossible to read by photocopiers. Um, this is a, it's like dark brown, like blue ink on, or dark red ink on, on, on dark red paper. Um, uh, the basic idea here is that, that, uh, that it would include a bunch of these little images and a bunch of populations and city names. The idea here is that when your game would start up, it would ask you a question, like, what is the population of the city, or find these little images and tell me what's next to it. If you started a game that said, turn to page, you know, eight of your manual and read the third word of the second paragraph, you sort of have seen this idea. It's this, it's this, idea that because games are very easy to copy, the, 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 the idea was is to embed in the game some sort of authentication protocol that involved a physical object that people had access to it as a way of making the games less easy to copy, right? Because it's harder to copy this because it can't be photocopied. Um, uh, uh, that's the sort of simple idea. Here's a, and who, who here has ever, who's here ever met a dongle, right? Like, yeah. They're like, who, and, and love them. Who, who's a member of the, the there, there, there is, as far as I know, no dongle Facebook group fan club. Um, uh, I, I gave a practice version of this talk, and someone's like, "I'm going to go. I'm going to go make a make one tonight." It's like, "Don't, don't do it." Um, um, uh, everyone who's met a dongle hates them, right? And yet, there's an industry of people who are paid to create dongles, which are sort of they have authentication chips in here. The idea is that you're running a very expensive piece of software, and so they create this physical thing, which is very difficult to copy, um, unlike, unlike the software, which you need present to the machine, and everyone hates them. I, I, I met I met a person once who, who worked on a uh, who had this incredible expensive piece of like a um, underwater uh, uh, charting software and it was like like you know thousands and thousands of dollars and it came with this dongle but apparently it was on a boat and it was like the dongle was very susceptible to like seawater so it would corrode and they couldn't they would have to go back into port it was like incredibly expensive like everyone hates dongles um, 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 but, but people are paid to engineer these things and it often adds significant cost to the technology when we buy expensive pieces of software the cost of this physical item and the engineering and the authentication protocol is all something that's part part of what we're paying for, right? Here's the reality. We all have copying machines on our desks, or I guess in this room on our laps, right? We have incredible, we have, we have the best copying m machines ever created. Every time we run a program, it's copied into memory. Every time we copy something, we send something over the network, it's copied you know, um, in different places, right? C computers are copying machines, that what's what they do. And the reality is that over the last sort of, uh, 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 the, you know, over the last two decades, the, the, there's been a, a, a huge effort to make them, make computers less good at copying, right? Um, uh, to turn our perfect copying machines into less perfect copying machines. Um, it's, been a, it's, been, it's been a huge effort and it's cost a huge amount of money. Um, I could give an entire talk about anti-features and DVDs, so I won't do that. Um, there's region coding, there's encryption, there's watermarking technologies. Um, I could go on about Blu-ray, I could go forever, but I'm just gonna say one little thing about DVDs. That unskippable track at the beginning of every DVD, right? The, 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 the unskippable track that says, among other things, you cannot copy this DVD, right? How, ma how many, everyone here is like, press that button, like, skip, skip, right, and it doesn't work, right? Unless, unless we're using a free player, because I have yet to meet a, a, a free software player that respects the unskippable track in a DVD, right? <laughs> but, but, because if we, um, um, be, 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 because users hate it. Right? Um, and because in a free world, these things aren't possible. And that's sort of a good example here, right? How many thousands of days of human life have been wasted by people watching crap and trying to skip it um, and not being able to, putting up with frustration but on their technology, right? All right. It's depressing. Um, uh, uh, but there is hope, right? Um, uh, there is hope because there is hope in free software. And there's hope because the freedom to modify software in any way is the freedom to remove functionality that we don't want, right? And the freedom to share software and collaborate um, is the freedom to work together to work around predatory practices, right? Because we, when we have freedom, most anti-features are impossible. Um, or at the very least, anti-features become really low-hanging fruit for free software, right? As, de uh, um, as developers, because all we need to do is not build something um, in order, uh, uh, that, that our users don't want or are being forced to have, right? Um, which version of Ubuntu do I want? Well, let's see. How much memory do I want to use? Uh, how many applica graphical applications do I want to run at a given time, right? If my answers to those questions matter, how long do you think it would take for someone somewhere to fork Ubuntu and offer us the ability to not choose? Right? And the answer is obvious. Right? It wouldn't take any time at all. 
Um, now, um, uh, at the risk of sounding a little keynotey, I wanted to end by briefly talking about uh, how anti-features give us a way to understand and maybe even a way to explain, you know, to those of us who don't know what a recursive acronym is and, and don't, or why it would be funny. Um, uh, uh, three of the most important frontiers in the struggle for sort of software freedom and how anti-features are important. Those three examples are going to be mobile phones, network services, and uh, 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 digital rights or digital restrictions management, DRM. So, um, uh, mobile phones are both the most widely used um, and widely distributed forms of powerful computers and the least likely to act like computers because they are almost universally locked down to a degree that should seem extraordinary to all of us, but that for some reason we now all take for granted, right? The image on the slide is uh, apparently, I've been told, a SIM unlocker, which lets users uh, defeat an ANSI feature designed to keep their phone from working with an arbitrary cellular network, because a large number of phones uh, come in the world come locked to a particular carrier. Um, uh, this is basically an enforcing a monopoly ANSI feature. It should be familiar to all of us, right? And I don't need to tell you about locked phones because despite the fact that we all hate it, like, like no one's like, uh, excuse me, I got this unlocked phone. Could, could you please lock this to my carrier? I really, you know, I really don't want to be able to use this another SIM card, you know? Um, um, uh, because despite the fact that we all know about this, we've all come to expect it. And for the most part, we all just seem to take it, right? And if this were a, if this were a normal group of people, I might ask you how many of you have root on your phones or can install arbitrary uh, uh, software without permission of the person who sold you your phone. I can ask right now how many people uh, have root on their phones. A few, right? Um, uh, maybe a quarter of the room. Um, uh, uh, suffice it to say, most people cannot and most people do not. Um, cryptographic systems that prevent the installation of unapproved or unsigned images or software is an incredibly expensive anti-feature. There's an industry of people producing it, which is included in the prices of, of, of almost every phone that we buy. Um, even the best examples, right? This is, a, uh, a, a, this is the, the Android phone. Um, even the best examples of, of, of free software-friendly phones or software-freedom-friendly phones, um, anti-features are still very clear. This is, this, is, this is two versions of the phones. They may look very similar because they're almost the same phone. Android-based phones have come in two versions. There's the, 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 the white version is the, um, is the cheaper version. Um, which in the U.S. start sales sold for $200. It was locked to a carrier um, and had a particular contract and would only run an approved operating system. You could you could install applications, but you couldn't change the underlying operating system. And then the second one was, a and then the, the 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 black one is a developer phone, um, uh, which you could buy from Google for $226 more, which would allow you to make those changes. Right? $226 is the freedom tax. Um, uh, it's what it, 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 that's the one that I got. Um, and in and and for $226, you do not get uh, a, a key ring, um, and you do not get an if statement in the bootloader that that, 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 that will that will check to make sure that the, the image you're trying to install is signed by that, or the image you're trying to boot is signed. Now, I'm happy to pay the freedom tax, right? Because for me, it's worth it, right? It's the cost of removing an ANSI feature, and it's one that I'm willing to pay because I think in those terms, right? But most people, maybe even most people in this room, do not. Anti features are what means that we're all carrying around computers with microphones, cameras, other sensors, and that we trust them with our closest secrets and our most sensitive data, and that in almost all cases, these computers remain controlled completely and ultimately by companies that, that most of us don't trust really at all. Um, if we communicate about these anti-features as anti-features, we might begin to build real support for a free software phone alternative wh where these anti-features will become impossible. And it's something that we desperately need to do. Now, you know, poor, poor OpenMoco. I mean, OpenMoco. Who here has an OpenMoco? I saw a couple, right? There's a few. Poor OpenMoco didn't do a lot of things. Um, still doesn't do a lot of things, right? But the fact that it didn't do some of those things is pretty great. Um, all right. The second, the second area I want to talk about is uh, is network services. This is the uh, uh, this is the this is the GitHub list of subscription prices. I put this up here uh, uh, not because I want you to subscribe to GitHub. In fact, I I don't. Um, uh, but it's a combination of this sort of, this is a combination of sort of a subscription-based uh, monopoly model and market segmentation, and this is just like a menu of anti-features, right? You can like sort of pick and choose what you want to pay. The idea is, is that the more you pay, the less anti-features you get in, in some ways. Now, it's a little more complicated because they actually are selling you disk space on their servers, you know, so that's a feature. I mean, this is not, this is not only anti-features. But, but, um, but, but I think that the cost may be a little out of sync, right? I mean, I want to run five projects versus ten projects, so what's the going rate for, uh, for a, a line in, uh, a line in in, in a MySQL database, right? Like a row in a table, it's what, about a dollar a month, is that right? Yeah. Um, um, uh, the reason I put this up is to remind us that network services, sort of, that, that access to code is no longer the central issue. Um, what matters is autonomy and control in, in the network service model, right? Access to the code doesn't mean that, 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 you, that you can change any of these things. The service provider has control and they're the only one. 
GitHub's entire systems, the legal systems, the technical systems, have been crafted at immense effort and expense built on top of free tools in many cases. Um, and that's much of what we're paying for when we subscribe to a system like this. That we're paying for the billing system. We're paying for the monitoring system. We're paying for the roles, um, uh, you know, the, the, these different, you know, whether or micro, small, or medium. When we're paying for the system built to enforce it, right? The software that detects whether we've already created too many accounts or too many projects. The software that disables our access when our bill wasn't paid, right? All of these things are part of what we're paying for. Um, uh, Gatorius. I don't know if people use Gatorius. It's a, it's a, uh, it's basically a free software replacement for GitHub, right? And 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 and, and Gatorius doesn't have 100% of the features that GitHub does, but it is missing 100% of the ANSI features. Um, um, it's something that you can sort of install on your own system, right? And as a result, it has, and it started out before it did anything, or at least almost anything. It started out with an inherent advantage over over GitHub because there's a whole bunch of that system that they never, that the Gatorius developers will never have to build, um, because the users hate them. Um, and, and the reason I'm using this example is because I think it's a generic problem of, of hosted non-free services, right? Anti features um, uh, give us a way to understand the harm that they do, and in, in a way that lets us reflect on the way that these services sort of systematically disadvantage users, in a, and, and maybe an idea of what we might do about it. Um, uh, uh, my final sort of example is uh, 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 DRM. This is sort of digital restrictions management. This is a shirt you can buy this from the uh, Free Software Foundation. Uh, it goes great with uh, membership uh, if you want to sign up. Um, uh, uh, dis despite, um, despite, despite, er despite victories in the area of music, DRM continues to be a major threat to free software, both in, in, in video and software and embedded systems, um, in, in areas that I've talked about as well. And it's a very serious issue. And in a lot of ways, I think the DRM can be seen as sort of like the mother of all anti-features. Um, uh, one of my friends at the EFF sort of estimated that he believes there's probably somewhere around 10,000 people employed in the global DRM industry, right? 10,000 people building technology that, 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 that no one has ever asked. I mean, I, Corey Doctor, I, I believe Corey Doctor has said that no one wakes up in the morning and says, like, you know, I'd really like to be able to you know, copy my music to less places. I'd like to be able to play it on less devices. I'd like to be able to do less with the media that I have, right? Or be able to use my software in less places, right? No one's ever requested this. Um, but, but, um, um, and, and, but, but I think that this, the anti-feature-ness of DRM, like the anti-feature-ness of most of the things that I've showed up here, are a great way to actually start talking about the important issues of sort of autonomy and user freedom, because it's something that everyone understands. This is, this is like, I, this is a little, uh, an ad for, a, for an online music site, which I picked up, a, a, I don't know, maybe a year, a couple years ago, at a, at a cafe across the street from my house. And I, I do live in Cambridge, Massachusetts, but it was not a geek cafe. It was like a normal cafe that normal people go to. Um, um, and 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 uh, th this is an ad for Calabash Music. As you can see, they say DRM free, which is actually written in a bigger font and a brighter font um, than the actual name of the company itself. Right? Um, the fact that they are advertising what their what their system doesn't do. They're advertising technology that their system doesn't include as a way of encouraging people to come to their site, and it works because normal people um, un uh, don't want DRM. They're willing. They're more willing to go to to a place in order to not get it. And you actually see this is very common when b before in the in the pro in in in, D in the period of time when DRM for music was sort of dying, we saw that um, uh, the, the, a Apple quickly offered both DRM versions and non-DRM versions of the song, and the DRM versions cost one dollar, and the non-DRM versions cost one dollar and fifty cents. Um, um, that's, that, that's the freedom tax again, right? Um, it's the premium, right? It's just like the Sony so the, the, the Sony crapware um, uh, removal system, and it's just like that. So. Um, that's what I've got prepared, so um, I'll sort of try to end where, where, where I began, which is to say that in a perfect software development world, right, even the things that work, um, even when things work perfectly, what, what software developers want is simply not always what users want. Anti-features are the most extreme example of this, and that's why I think that they're useful to talk about. I hope I've shown a nice, that, 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 they're a, that they're a nice way to talk about some of the key issues in free software, right? Free software eliminates anti-features and ensures that we are closer to an alignment between the interests of developers and users. Um, this is an inherent advantage and part of the reason that I believe that free software will win. Thanks for listening to me and thanks for putting, up, uh, putting out such a wonderful conference. Thank you very much, Michael. It was great. Um, we do have time for if, just a few questions. So if people... Um, lawyers and doctors have a code of ethics. If a doctor ever, you know, purposefully killed somebody or whatever, they would lose their uh, license to perform medicine. Do we have a coder's code of ethics or a, uh, the equivalent of an AMA or a the bar association? And would somebody lose their job for taking the time to put in some sort of a anti-feature into a 
piece of software? Uh, so, uh, hmm. well, so uh, as I think I've shown, there are many tens of thousands of people, uh, maybe even hundreds of thousands of people, whose job it is to build anti-features. Presumably, if they didn't build anti-features, they might lose their job. So I think that that's a... a uh, that's a wonderful utopian vision, um, uh, uh, and I think it's one we should all work towards. Um, there are a few organizations that have tried to put forward sort of hackers' codes of ethics. I've seen a couple of them, um, uh, and I think that uh, uh, popularizing such work um, is is an important is, is an important goal, and it's one that I will subscribe to any such any such project that's in line with my own principles. So uh, that's a that's a great suggestion. Hi, Michael. To, to your left. Hey. Oh, oh, Follow there you are. Follow. Sorry. Hey. hey. Um, when I went to the UK, I very much enjoyed being able to buy a mobile phone for 10 quid that had 5 quid of airtime on it. Mm -hmm. um, that's really not going to happen if I can just jailbreak that phone and, and move it to another provider. Do you think that maybe there is room for anti-features to still exist in a utopia? Are, are we actually in a better world if we don't have anti-features at all? Um, so, 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 uh, so I, I mean, I think that... that, that the way I've defined anti-features is that they're technology that users, the, the things that, that users don't want. So, so I mean, people want some pretty perverse things. Um, uh, that's true. Um, and I think that there's, that, that um, I mean, I guess that in a sense, I think there's, 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 there's room for people to want sort of different things, possibly. I think that, that, um, uh, I mean, I, I think that there, there are some things which will not be possible in a free world or in sort of any, any type of thing, and, and things, that, things that we might want. I mean, uh, one of my favorite examples of this is, the, is, is uh, people who use, um, there's been some issues with uh, GPL and DRM systems um, built around uh, online gaming. People design uh, games so that people, you know, GPL games, right? The, the free, free, free software, anyone can change them, right? But they have a DRM system built to keep people from cheating on them. Um, and, and that's something that I have a lot of, like, I mean, I have a lot of sympathy for that, right? It's like, I, I mean, people don't want people to cheat on games. It makes the game not fun. Um, but the DRM system seems to go against, you know, I mean, takes away user control and the ability to, to modify things in an important sense. Um, it's a conflict. There are an important set of conflicts, in, especially on the edge cases, between, between freedom and things that we would like and would like to do. And um, I, I don't know. I mean, my answer is, is that I think that human beings are incredibly creative, resourceful people. And uh, uh, I mean, th th there's two ways of answering a question like that. The first is to say, uh, well, I can't imagine how that would work. Therefore, we shouldn't try to do it. Um, and the second answer is to say, I believe that this is, an, this is, a, this is the utopia that I want to, this, this is the goal that I want to achieve. How are we going to do it? Um, and uh, uh, I, believe that, I believe that we're smart enough and creative enough that we can have both freedom and a world we'd want to live in. Um, maybe that's just silly of me, but uh, I wouldn't want to live in any other, uh, in any other world. So. Um, uh, um, hi. To your left. Uh, Stage left. Okay, okay, sorry, sorry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Damn it. <laughs> um, hi. Um, first of all, I mean, obviously, uh, thank you. Awesome talk. Um, I think that the being helping look for and identify any features is going to help us as consumers to try and, you know, market pressure and all that kind of thing. But what can we do as, you know, as developers, as people in the community, as people working in, in government, you know, what's, what's useful kind of, I guess, civil disobedience in this um, area that we can partake in? Hmm. So, I mean, part of the way that I've conceived of anti-features, and I probably should have said this in the beginning, is is as a way. I mean, so is as a way of talking about software freedom to people who are uh, less sort of like sort, sort of like in this, right? I mean, the, the the reality is is that the the group of people who are members of organizations like the Free Software Foundation or the Electronic Frontier Foundation or any of these sort of organizations. I mean, the, there's basically like the people who understand the, the political implications of control over technology basically boil down to hackers who understand it because they have that power, right? They, they know it because we, we know it because because we we do it, right? And then some people who sort of basically like people like like Biela Coleman, like like people that sort of study study science and technology and understand the power because it's their, their job to understand that, right? Um, um, the reality is is that the vast majority of people don't understand that technology is powerful because they don't really think about technology in those terms. And, 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 and a large part of how I've conceived anti-features is a way of talking about technology more broadly in a way that can actually make real negative impact of, the real negative impact of, of, of predatory proprietary development practices really visible to, 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 to users. So I think that, 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 I mean, part of what we can do is we can, we can, we can use, uh, as developers, we can use what our software doesn't do as a way of advocating for it. 
we can also, um, um, and, and when we're talking to people, certainly people like government or, or, or other places, I mean, it's, a, it's, 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 I think, a useful tool for advocacy and a useful way of, of, of framing um, this entire discussion. Um, I mean, I, I think that the, the, the news for developers is pretty good because all you need to do is not do things um, to gain an advantage in a whole bunch of different areas. Um, and thinking of those terms can maybe, I don't know, make us feel better. Um, uh, uh, and, and, and I hope that, that, that looking at some of this stuff is also kind of funny because I think that, I think that, that, I think that laughing and, and not taking yourself too seriously is actually a really important part of staying sane. So um, uh, that's sort of one thing. I don't know. That, maybe that wasn't a great answer, but uh, that's what I got right now. Um, so yeah. is that it? Or so uh, one last question. Um, can I, uh, with the thinking, I was thinking before when you were talking about um, you know, camera batteries and phone batteries, uh, the other problem that we have as users is that there are companies out there that if there was no restriction on what battery you'd get, they'd label it as a 3,000 you know, micro milliamp hour battery but you actually got a one milliamp hour battery or it dissolved your phone or something like that. And that's because at, at that point, when we bought it, we have no way of testing those claims. And part of the, the manufacturer's promise, which is you know, why they, they want to, uh, you know, they're, they're happy to also include these anti-features in batteries and printer cartridges and so forth, is in order to, sort of in quotes, to protect the users against dodgy stuff. How do we get the best of both worlds by having good you know, things that are legitimately tested, so I think but that, still not uh, locked down against us? Right. Um, that's a that's a great question. So, I mean, I think that part of the issue is that dissolving phones is, as far as I know, already illegal. Um, uh, uh, and 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 I mean, I, I once heard someone give a give, write a book where they were talking about how it was really um, the, the trademark law was really important because people might label you know um, uh, infant uh, formula incorrectly in ways that will kill children, right? And it's like, listen, if someone murders a child and the worst thing they've done is violate a trademark. Um, we have bigger problems, right? Um, I mean, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a huge advocate of consumer protection. I mean, this is this is this is an, in a sense this is what this entire thing is about, right? Um, um, I mean, I think that there are places for open protocols and to to do things like uh, uh, you know test systems to make sure that they're they're working well. And I think that in general, there, you know, we can do things like the, the same thing we do in other places. When we go and how do we know that, that the food we buy isn't sort of tainted or includes great ingredients or when it says it's organic, that it includes organic stuff. I mean, the answer is that we, we don't buy from dodgy places. I mean, we do all the things that we normally do as sort of savvy, savvy customers. Um, um, and, I think that that's, and I think that that's part of my answer. It's already illegal to make sort of like dodgy, mislabeled, incorrect stuff, especially stuff that's going to dissolve our phones or do bad things. And, and, and I think that strengthening the, maybe the law against that sort of thing is, is, is what I think is the more appropriate response. I think that the, the, the idea that we should make technology, that, that, you know, it's, a very self, it's very self-serving when we hear these arguments from people, no, 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 we really just want to protect you. And it's like, yeah, yeah, like, I'm sure you do as you like, rake it in. You know? um, uh, uh, but but uh, 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 I mean, I think we should look carefully at who's making these sorts of arguments. So. And we should uh, do all the things that we normally do so, uh, to ensure that we're protected as consumers. So uh, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Vago. <Mango. laughs>